Coming up, a grandmother is healed at a youth service. Welcome to 700 Club Canada. We're so glad that you've joined us today. And today is National Seniors Day. Yeah. And so we're talking about legacy. And the, when I thought of National Seniors Day, something that I thought of was this uh, lady at our uh, previous church I went to, Maria. And every Tuesday, I would pick her up on my way to work because I worked at the church there. And she would come in with me and she would clean the kitchen. Mm. I mean, from top to bottom, in the cupboards, everywhere. And I just remember how emotional she would get that she had the privilege and honor to clean the kitchen because she knew it was used as a place of hospitality. And I remember that was her legacy. That was something that she really felt she was making a difference and she poured her heart into that. Yeah, I remember someone taught me, one of my mentors, a concept that everything we experienced was built on the shoulders of great men and women who mm. went before us. And so all of you seniors watching, thank you so much for your investment yeah. of time, talent, and treasure, your prayers over the, you know, your lifetime. We honor you today on this special day. And now this is how the prayers of some passionate teenagers led to a grandmother's healing of stage three cancer. I was in stage three cancer. Cancer is the devil. My state of mind at that time, I was just wallowing. Okay. Rue is a very special lady to many people. She is kind of that grandma to our church and our, especially our teenagers. And she's just that one constant in their life. I love her to death. And I don't know what I would do if she wasn't here anymore. She's like a grandma to me. Because I'm drawn to the youth. I love them. It fills my heart. And a lot of the kids, they need it and they need something outside, or not just sadness, just happiness. For a few months, I hadn't been feeling well, and I had gone to a doctor, and everything came out okay, they said, and I was feeling worse, and I went to a second doctor, and they found the cancer. Radiation turned into chemo. Chemo was awful. It was killing me, I felt. And my heart broke, you know, because uh, she had been dealing with this for, for months without it telling anybody. I couldn't hide it any longer. I was sick and I couldn't hide it. I couldn't even do a smile. I was just, it was just wiping me out. That Wednesday night, she mustered up the strength and she just popped in to the back of our service during the worship time. Because I love watching them worship. They have such a love for the Lord and to watch them praise and with the arms up, just touches my heart. It uplifts me. And you know, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me and said, you need to pray for her. Pastor Amanda came up and asked if the youth could pray for me. So she went forward and told the children about my cancer and that I've been sick, and would they pray for me? I get very emotional. So I went down forward in front of the altar and all the kids, they just, they didn't even hesitate. They got right up in their seats and they all gathered around me and laid hands on me. And then she fell out in the spirit and the kids had never seen that before. I felt myself being lifted up off the floor. I was crying. I started shaking, almost like a seizure. And someone was holding me and saying, Rue, don't fight it, it's God taking out your cancer. That stopped, and I just started laughing, hysterically, like a nut. But then this calm came over my whole body, and when the service was over, the children left, they would give me hugs. I left here, and I felt energized. She walked out changed, um, and when people come in sick and, and, and broken, and they turn around and they walk out a different person, you know, it does something to you. I, I haven't been a youth pastor very long. So there's always those doubts, you know, why am I here? <laughs> why am I doing what I'm doing? But to see God move, it, it confirms a lot of stuff in you. The entire week, I was just full of life, and I felt healed, and I knew I was healed. I had to wait three weeks to get a PET scan, and the PET scan came back, no cancer. I was able to take the microphone and get it in front of the students and say, you know what, here's this woman who basically had a death sentence. You know, she's healed, and it was one of the best moments, you know, to, to see their faces. I think it's opened their eyes more to the Lord. 
think they believe like they never believed before. So we wait for God to move and we trust him and we believe. Um, I think that we have great faith here. I used to be like a Christian who wouldn't really pray for people outside of church, but now I'll go around and if I see someone who's kind of like sad or something, I'll go and ask if they need prayed for. These kids, they're just like, you know, God's gonna heal you. And so they just step out and, and just really just take that leadership role in, in, in our church and our community. I had a supernatural healing. I'm thankful and I just wish more people would open their hearts and their mind to Jesus because he is real. His grace and his mercy is just overwhelming. You know, what I love about this story is that Rue's commitment to those kids, though it wouldn't have made headlines by world standards, it carried far more weight. It had eternal significance. Her investment in building relationships with these young people week after week made a real difference in their lives. If she hadn't poured into them, they may not have been the ones praying over her and witnessing her miracle firsthand. So we can see through her story that what we do today truly shapes tomorrow. We may not always see how or why our efforts matter in the moment, but there will be fruit from our faithfulness. God promises that. We see it in Galatians 6 verse 9. It reminds us, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You know, we also see the act of faith by Pastor Amanda and the young people, the youth, being used in a miraculous way. When we step out in obedience and faith, God honors that. It's a powerful reminder that even the smallest acts of faith can have far-reaching impact. And that can be true in our life. So let me just pray for us in this moment for that faith to step out. God, we just thank you that you promise that as we are faithful, God, there will be impact, that there will be fruit from that. And so we just pray for each person today that they would walk in that understanding that as they um, step out in faith, God, that you will use them in incredible ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we would love for you to call our prayer line today at 1-855-759-0700, where we can provide you with a pamphlet entitled Faith. Well, next, baseball great Daryl Strawberry turned minister shares why he and his wife have taken on the opiate crisis. We need to deal with sin in this culture because it keeps us separated from God's great love. Uh, the depth of bondage is real. Daryl Strawberry was an eight-time All-Star and four-time World Series champion. Admired for his swing, but notorious for his self-destructive addictions he would later overcome. The slugger turned minister has since opened addiction centers in Florida, where he and his wife Tracy have answered the charge to take on the opioid crisis. You've learned a lesson over the years. It reminds you it's never about you. I think too many of us think it's about us, but it's about his plan and his purpose working through you to make a difference in someone else's life. Summarize your baseball career. Awesome. When you play it and be successful and be broken at the same time. That's so amazing to be able to do the things that I was able to do throughout my major league career. It's only a short window for you to excel and then it's over, and then who are you? Does it look different to you now on this side of it? <laughs> That's a good point, Tom. It looks totally different now. When I look at old clips of me and I say, wow, I just couldn't believe how good I was. I never recognized myself as that. I enjoyed playing. I had fun winning. Your rock bottom. Well, I had a lot of rock bottoms, but the real rock bottom was in the Florida State Prison with a T17169 because of addiction. Not guilty of any crime, but guilty of the consequences because of my sins. And how did I get here from stardom to the pit? 
What do you find to be the most frequent source for addiction? What I find more than anything is, is how is a household? If you're not there and available for the kids and you're not pouring real things into their life, a lot of fathers don't understand why kids are broken because the father has never walked a, a faithful walk and now it's allowed his kids to be affected. What was childhood like for you? It was very difficult, uh, it was very challenging, um, very lonely more than anything. And the brokenness of, of my life became because of the emptiness and the rejection from my father. You know, I found myself playing baseball because of my pain, which my pain would eventually lead me to my greatness and then eventually lead me to my destructive behavior because of the emptiness inside. Growing addictions nationally, what's the concern you have about this epidemic? The concern I have about the epidemic of opiate and heroin addiction is people are losing their life. And pharmaceutical companies are getting rich. Now the kid, 15, 16 years old, once they alter their mind, their mind changes forever. And once prescription painkillers come into play, they get addicted to them immediately because they can always go back and get more. It's just like a drug dealer on the street. Youth, what's between your experience at that age and their experience? As a person who has struggled with that and remember the fingers being pointed at me, I'm realizing today that our society is broken, spiritually broken. It's why we have such a uh, negative impact with addiction and we need to bring hope. People need to come back and learn to love people and help people right where they're at. Are rehab agencies open to consider faith? Uh, treatment centers are more open and actually I'm turning my, my treatment facility into a Christian Christ-centered treatment center because I know it works. And I think the government is looking into more faith-based programs to come into play to make a difference. A person's issues, it re-involves their entirety. That's the only way you're gonna get well. I mean, we've dealt with it from so many different angles and it hasn't put a dent into what's happening. If we can get biblical principles back into people's lives, uh, people will get well. And he brings about restoration and restore people's lives to wholeness. I'm a prime example. Addiction is addiction. Where else are we seeing signs in society? Sex addiction is very powerful. And that's why you see so many men get caught up in pornography because it's a desire that has developed inside of you and you find yourself in places that you can never imagine. And my sex addiction was very strong um, and I lost two marriages because of that. As destructive as drug addiction? Yes, it is. So many struggle with it, and we don't want to talk about it because it's shameful, because you have to stop kidding yourself and stop lying to yourself and safeguard yourself. When we deal with those real inside issues, that's when we become overcomers. For those watching, whatever the addiction is, how do they confront it to become free? Commit to someone else and openly share your struggles. When we can get to that place, you can get delivered. You understand that he loves you right where you're at it, but Christ himself will never point fingers at you. He'll say, come as you are. Christ is here to rescue you first. Then he's here to redeem you with his blood. Then he's gonna restore you with his grace. That broad measure of deliverance for you, Daryl Strawberry, Jesus Christ has become a, a hero, a rescue. What does he mean to you? Christ means everything to me. I always wanted to know why I was created, not just hitting home runs and winning championships and making millions of dollars, but why am I here? And I needed to understand that. And when you come and make your commitment to Jesus, he will show you everything about yourself and he will deliver you and he will set you free from the bondage and the chains of darkness. Daryl Strawberry's story is one of redemption and restoration, and it really is a powerful reminder that no matter how far we've fallen, Christ can always lift us back up. At the height of his fame, you know, Daryl had it all. He had talent, wealth, and admiration, but his life was derailed by addiction, and he hit rock bottom. But the good news is that his story didn't end there, and yours doesn't have to either. As Daryl himself said, commit to someone else and share your struggles. That simple but profound act of vulnerability changed his life. You know, Daryl found healing by opening up to God and to others and realizing that we were never meant to fight our battles alone. You weren't. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. 
you know, when I find myself in a place I don't want to be, I've learned three things to bring freedom to myself. Um, and the first is that I need to admit that I need to be rescued, that I can't do it on my own. I actually start every day with this acknowledgement. But second, you need to ask for and accept that God has forgiven you. That's the point of the cross. It's more than just a story or a historical event. It is a transformative reality that you can experience today. And then third, I've recognized I need accountability. I need to surround myself with others who can help me win the battle one day at a time. And so if you're battling right now, I just wanna pray a, a prayer of freedom with you. And I want you to believe that yes, you can find what Daryl has found, what I have found, and so many found in places they don't wanna be in Jesus. And so God, whatever those who are watching right now are going through, God, maybe they feel like it's too late, it's too difficult, it's impossible, but God, that's when you do your best work. Bring freedom, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. If you are needing help, we'd love to pray with you. Please don't hesitate to call us at 1-855-759-0700. We have a great resource entitled Free Indeed. Well, coming up, former TV host of The View, Paula Ferris, steps down from her role as anchor to pursue a new passion. If God puts something on your heart, you can't run from it. <laughs> or you can try, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna work out well. So Paula Ferris took a leap of faith in 2018, she stepped down from her successful run as co-host on The View and left the anchor desk of Good Morning America Weekend to pursue what she calls a passion project with the ABC Network, a podcast called Journeys of Faith with Paula Ferris. I really wanted to give listeners an opportunity to hear from newsmakers and um, from influencers, what does their faith journey look like? What gets them through their chapters of triumph and their chapters of tragedy? What holds them together? Paula says her relationship with God keeps her grounded at work in an additional role as ABC senior national correspondent and at home as a wife and mother. During a rough patch early on in her marriage, she relied on faith to keep her family together. We've been married 18 years now, thank God. Um, but it's been a lot of work and we were just talking about it recently. You know, thank God we didn't abandon our relationship, even though at that moment it didn't feel like there was much worth fighting for. When it came to our marriage, we stuck it out. And I can really only say it's because of God. You know, it's at that moment, neither of us really, even though I had moved out, neither of us had a real peace about it. And so we stuck it out. We have three beautiful kids and we're doing so well now. She says making a distinction between her identity and career was a breakthrough to a more stress-free, fulfilled life. That was the main reason why I stepped away from anchoring GMA weekends and from The View. I didn't feel like I really had much of a work-life balance. It was hard to step away from those two jobs that I didn't realize had I defined me so much. And I just have to remember to give myself as much grace as I give other people and that it's not about being perfect. It's about a journey and to love myself and to love others through it. And, you know, it, it helps too that, you know, I've surrounded myself, my friends really couldn't care less what I do for a living. During her podcasts, she's hoping to empower and encourage listeners through conversations with guests from varying faith backgrounds, including celebrities and influencers like Luke Bryan, Sherry Shepard, and Reza Aslan, to name a few. I've had a guest on that was an atheist and another that was Muslim, which I learned a ton about about Islam, and I think some of the more profound conversations that we have as Christians are with people that we don't necessarily see eye to eye with. And it's important in this moment to sit down and listen to people and respect people, no matter where they're coming from, and show them love. So who would she love to invite for a future episode? I'd love to get Snoop Dogg on, I'm just telling you. He released a gospel album about a year ago He's had this sudden resurgence or rediscovery or conversion to Christianity. And I feel like people don't give him a chance. I would love to have him on the podcast and give him an opportunity to talk about it. Paula has high expectations for the next season of Journeys of Faith. And you know, the first season, it's you try to figure out what works and what doesn't. You try to see how people are gonna receive it. And people, you know, were very receptive to it. And I'm super excited and I know once again, you know, there's that fear, oh my gosh, are people gonna listen? But I know, once again, if God calls you to do something, he'll equip you. Paula Ferris, sharing her own journey of faith as a reflection of God's love. I'm nothing without my relationship with Jesus. And that's the thing, it's not a religion, it's, it's a relationship. 
And, you know, I just try to ask myself, how would Jesus handle this situation? You know, do people see Jesus in me? That's the thing too. And sometimes I feel like I might be the only Jesus that you might see today. And this might be my only crack. So it's just, for me, it's a constant reminder of the magnitude of the responsibility that we have as Christians to love God, love people, and show them the love of Jesus. Tomorrow on the 700 Club Canada, dead for 13 minutes, Jim makes a stunning recovery. When we ask the question of, am I really making a difference? For many of us at the core of this question is an even deeper one. Am I living out my God-given calling? Well, let's look at Ephesians 2.10, which says this. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You know, this verse reminds us of two essential truths. First, you were intentionally created by God. You are his handiwork, his masterpiece, and your life has purpose. And second, the good works that you are called to do were prepared by God long before you even knew them. It's not about scrambling to find our purpose. God already has a plan for each one of us. And as we walk in it, we trust in his guidance towards that. But what does it mean to live that out, to live out our calling? You know, often we think about it as reaching a certain destination, a point where we can say we've arrived. But Ephesians 4 verse one shifts our perspective. It says this, Paul writes as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Our calling is less about a final destination and more about how we live every day. Paul wrote this while in prison, a place he certainly didn't plan to be. Yet even there, he was confident that he was living out his calling because it wasn't about where he was, but how faithfully he was following Christ. Our calling starts with a relationship with Jesus. Before anything else, we are called to him. Jesus said in Mark 8, verse 34, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And as we walk with Jesus, God shapes us to reflect more of his character. We may wonder if our actions have an impact, but God cares not just about what we do, but who we are becoming the fruit of our lives, love, patience, kindness, are all a part of fulfilling our calling. So if you're questioning whether you're making a difference, consider this. You were created with purpose. You are called to follow Christ and your everyday faithfulness matters to God. Even when you don't see the full picture, God is using you in ways you may not realize. So stay close to Him, trust in His timing, and remember that your faithfulness in small, everyday things is part of living a life worthy of your calling. You are making a difference because God has called you to walk with him. And that's a difference that lasts for eternity and builds bold faith. Every day, people across Canada are being impacted by the powerful stories we share on our show, finding hope and coming to know Jesus in a personal way. Our mission is to spread the gospel in transforming lives, and we want to reach even more hearts. So today, for a one-time donation, you enable us to continue sharing these life-changing messages, bringing the hope of Christ into homes all across our great nation. And if you call right now, we'll send you a gift entitled, The Genius of Israel. This is our gift to you for faithfully supporting this ministry and helping transform lives. You'll also receive our monthly newsletter, Frontlines. So would you call us right now at 
759-0700, and let's do this together. A nation in a fight for its existence becomes a model of hope, community, and innovation. So how does Israel thrive despite its constant struggles? I think Israel may be the most resilient country in the world. From integrating youth into national service to companies supporting working parents. We do a better job of maximizing human potential. Explore a culture built on belonging. It's this incredible sense of we are home. Solidarity. We're all encouraging each other, lifting each other up. We're a unit. And service. Everyone knows they have a part, and everyone knows how to pivot from normalcy to crisis on a dime. Join CBN's Gordon Robertson to discover Israel's true innovation, its people. We are not going to be normal. We are going to be exceptional. And I think that is the genius of Israel. You know, Bill, we've been talking about the question, am I making a difference? And a common thread throughout our stories and the things that we talked about today was really about faithfulness and really focusing on who are we becoming as opposed to uh, arriving somewhere when it comes to purpose and legacy and making a difference in people's lives. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because I think when a lot of us reflect on, am I making a difference? We're tempted to compare ourselves with other people, yeah. especially people that are you know, influencers or in media. And that's not God's definition of legacy at all. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, legacy in the Bible is simply people, common people like you and I, who just say yes to him every day. And they may seem like small things, but to God, they're big things because yeah. he uses every little part for something greater. And so yeah. really leaving a legacy is just saying yes to whatever God is asking you today. Yeah, and often when we look at people, I think sometimes even for myself, when I look at people who I think, oh, look at what they've accomplished. Yes. When you really sit with them, you realize for them, it's been those small everyday moments for them that's led them to where they are. And they were faithful in those moments. And so they're seeing that when you're seeing sort of the larger picture. Well, kind of like a farmer. Right. Like no one sees the plowing and the yeah. picking out of the rocks and the hard work. They see the harvest. But that doesn't come without all the work in, in, in advance. And so I, I agree with you. That's a really good point. Like, so just really be faithful and trust God with the results. Maybe that's yeah. the best way to do it. Yes. If you want to leave a yeah. legacy, do what God asks you and leave, leave the results to him. That's good. And we have some comments from people who have been impacted by the ministry of 700 Club Canada that we'd like to share with you. Michael says, the 700 Club Canada does tremendous work. I'm grateful for what the 700 Club Canada does. Thank you. And Alan says, I'm glad to be able to give you... To to give to your ministry, you do a great job. Yeah, thank you so much for those kind words. And our power verse today is found in James 1.22, where it says, do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. And there's that reminder again, right? Just, if yeah. you don't know what to do, read scripture, what Jesus did, and try your best to do that. Thank you so much for watching, especially all of you seniors watching today. Happy National Seniors Day.